Some of you will remember a time, long ago, when there was no such thing as cable television. That ancient time before DVDs and VHS tapes. When I was a boy, you literally could not record anything on television. So if you wanted to see something, you had to be in front of the television set when they were showing it. Otherwise, you missed it. When I was a boy, there were programs that were broadcast once a year, and families marked their calendars so that they could be in front of their black and white Zenith television in order to see it. And I remember some of those programs. The Charlie Brown Christmas Special. How the Grinch Stole Christmas. And there was always excitement when, once a year, they broadcast my favorite movie, The Wizard of Oz. My brother and I put on our pajamas, and Mom would make Jiffy Pop popcorn as a special treat. And Dad gave us the same stern reminder every year. Remember, boys, if you have to use the restroom, do so during the commercials. Otherwise, you'll, you'll miss your favorite parts of the movie. My favorite part of The Wizard of Oz is when Dorothy and her friends meet the wizard for the first time. They see that huge head surrounded by smoke and flames, and the wizard's voice booms through the hall, and the cowardly lion shakes with fear. I love that scene. But one year, as that scene was approaching on our television, my mind had started to wander toward the cookie jar in the kitchen, and I asked my mother if, if I could have an Oreo. And she said, yes, but wait until the commercial. You don't want to miss your favorite part. But I did not want to wait. So I got up and left my family on the couch, and I went to the kitchen, and frankly, I got more than one Oreo cookie from the cookie jar, and then I remembered that it's just impossible uh, to have Oreos without milk. I needed some milk to dunk the cookies in, so I poured myself a glass of milk and took my cookies and finally rejoined my family in the living room, and I dunked an Oreo in the milk, and I looked at the television, and it was a commercial. Please, Mr. Whipple, please don't squeeze the Charmin. And my mother said to me, you missed it. I missed it? Mom said, you missed your favorite scene. You should have been here with us. We all saw it, and now you're going to have to wait until next year to see it. And my mother said, maybe you'll, you'll learn an important lesson while you wait. My heart sank. In those days, before video recording, I would indeed have to wait a whole year to see that scene where Dorothy meets the wizard. And to add insult to injury, just then, as I was realizing all this, the Oreo cookie that I was dunking in the milk, well, it broke off, and most of it sank to the bottom of the glass. I had to wait an entire year to see what I wanted to see. And I did indeed learn an important lesson while I waited. And that lesson was, always listen to your parents. In today's powerful passage from John's Gospel, most of the disciples see something wonderful, but one disciple misses it. On the evening of that first Easter Sunday, the disciples of Jesus are together. John tells us that they have locked themselves in a room. After all, they saw what the authorities had done to Jesus on Good Friday. Perhaps they were frightened that the authorities would come after them next. They were afraid. And they were confused. Mary of Magdala had gone to the tomb, and, and she came back 
with strange stories of angels and a missing body and a gardener. It was all so confusing. So they were sad and they were scared. They were confused. But then they saw it. They saw him, Jesus, risen, standing in their midst despite the crucifixion, despite the locked doors. He spoke to them of peace and forgiveness. He breathed upon them his spirit. He was alive somehow. And they all saw it with their own eyes. Except for Thomas. Thomas had left the room. We don't know why. We don't know where he went. What we do know is he was not with them. He was not with those early Christians in their moment of sadness and confusion and fear. And because he was not with them, he missed it. He didn't see it. And Thomas had to wait. Did you notice that detail in John's Gospel? When the others told Thomas that they had seen the Lord, Thomas declared that he would not believe it until he himself saw Jesus with his own eyes, until he touched the wounds in Jesus' body. That's what Thomas said. And then he had to wait. Monday went by. Tuesday went by. The Gospel of John tells us that Thomas has to wait an entire week before the risen Lord appears again. And when he did appear, Thomas saw and believed, my Lord and my God. Thomas's profession of faith is important. But don't forget the fact that Thomas had to wait an entire week. Jesus could have appeared to Thomas and the others at any time. Which makes me wonder, why did the Lord make Thomas wait that long before he appeared to Thomas and the others again? Was there something that Thomas needed to learn during that waiting? Perhaps there was a lesson that he could only learn by waiting. Now, we normally don't like to wait when we pray. In fact, we often hate to wait especially when we've been nice enough to tell God what we want and how we want it and why we want it, and we want God to deliver it on our schedule. Thomas has to wait. Perhaps there was indeed a lesson that Thomas would learn as he waited, and perhaps that lesson was this. If you want to see the risen Lord, don't isolate yourself. Think of it this way, if Thomas had been with the rest of the disciples on that first Easter day, he would have seen the risen Lord, but he wasn't there, and so he missed it. He has to wait. And then the next Sunday, when Thomas was with the Christian community, that's when Christ appears again, and that's where Thomas's doubts are transformed into faith. In many Christian churches, this Easter season is a time when we baptize new members of our communities. On one hand, baptism is a beautiful revelation of the spirit-fired relationship that each of us can have as beloved daughters and sons of God. But baptism is not just a sign of the graced relationship between a person and Christ. It's also the right which reveals that each believer is welcomed into the community of the church. You see, our journey of faith doesn't take place in isolation. We don't have to walk to heaven alone. We don't have to ask our questions by ourselves and try to figure out the answers without the help of others. 
Baptism reveals that we are members of Christ's body, the church. And it's here in the community of that church that Christ most often chooses to make his presence known and reveal the beauty of his love and change people's lives, our lives, for the better. But we won't see it if we're not here together. We may miss it if, if we're in the kitchen chasing Oreos. We'll miss it if we're, we're doing our own thing or, or doing the spiritual thing without a brother or sister to walk beside us. Many Americans today say that they are spiritual, but that they don't need a, a religion. They don't need a, a church community. Sure, they believe in God, but, but they're convinced that they don't need to belong to a community of believers. But I think that Thomas learned a different lesson. During that long week while he's waiting, perhaps he had to listen to the other disciples speak with excitement about how the risen Lord looked and, and what he said and how they felt when they saw him alive that first time. I'm guessing that in some way Thomas might have felt left out because for some reason he had decided on that first Easter Sunday that he didn't need to be there, that is, with the family of faith. But the next week he was there, and so were the other believers, and so was the risen Christ. Thomas's experience might teach us that we literally cannot survive and flourish as people of faith without other people of faith around us to love us, encourage us, teach us, strengthen us, challenge us, and share faith with us. The journey to Jesus doesn't happen in isolation. If we live in isolation, whose feet will we wash? If we live in isolation, whose burdens will we help bear? If we live in isolation, whose crosses can we help carry? If we live in isolation, whose wounds will we dress? If we live in isolation, whose tears will we dry? If we live in isolation, where will we find twos and threes gathered in the Lord's name? If we live in isolation, how will we ever see the risen Lord at work in people who inspire us? He is risen. He is here. And we can see him in a community of believers, in a person bathed in the waters of baptism, in bread and wine placed upon a table, in generous service to our neighbor, neighbors, faithful to the example of Jesus. There is nothing more important in life than experiencing the risen one. So don't walk away from the body, the community, where the risen one has revealed himself for 2,000 years. You want to see him, don't you? <laughs>